A cryptocurrency like a digital dollar could provide many benefits. The Fed hasn't set a timetable yet, but it's expected to be online in about two years. This is the IG Trading Talk and I'm Manuel Koch. And joining me now are Salah Idine Boumidi. He's the head of markets at IG. Today he's at the Euronext in Amsterdam. Salah, so good to see you. Hi, guys. And the legendary, iconic Einstein of Wall Street, Peter Tuckman, over 35 years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Peter, also so good to see you. From the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> Great to see you, exactly. everyone. Yeah, from the financial heart. Uh, so good to see you guys. Uh, a lot of things uh, happened already, but uh, Peter, maybe we talk first about the digital dollar. What do you think about a payment system like a digital dollar? Do you think yeah, notes in your wallet will disappear? Is that a good thing? You know what? I mean, you know, for, you know, for me, I've been a bit resistant of the whole digital space. And I think the digital dollar is surely a different uh category than digital currency from as an investment crypto and whatnot i think obviously any payment system that can be done digitally or electronically or through the internet is surely something that appears to be the way of the future right there was a young man um a company and i believe that they are soon to go public a gentleman in africa in west africa who was setting up these i i don't remember the name of it now but with the question you asked me, it brings it to my mind about the fact that there are so many that this company became a digital payment system in West Africa at the beginning of COVID, right? When basically people were not wanting to transact dollar bills from each other and that the outbreak in COVID, I believe it was like April, May of 2020, this young man started this digital payment system. It was very small at the time, but I believe it's now grown into a company that I believe is soon to go public. But basically, I think the transaction of money, we, look, we already have it in a way through our PayPals and our Venmos and whatnot, right? These are electronic, digital, I guess they could be digital, a uh, transfer of, of cash payments uh, through the Internet. So clearly the way of the future, um, you know, whether it's in a world that's worried about the cost of transferring money, the actual manual transfer of money from our wallet to wallet or whatnot it definitely seems like something that is the way of the future yeah good good future is always a good good point peter and i was looking last week on a really interesting thing which is the overnight reverse repo not everybody's looking for it especially not traders every day it's something which is which is related to money market experts but if we look on the overnight reverse repo the volume at the fed's overnight reverse surged to 433 billion on tuesday according to the new york fed data and this was the largest uptake ever The biggest beginning being actually was on December 31 in 2015, I guess, yes. And yeah, since April, we have seen a search. Now people are thinking, first of all, what is this reverse repo? So you, as a bank, you either have the money that you that is printed, you either have the possibility to give it out to the public, of course, not for free, you will get credit, this is one of your business models, Or you will park the money overnight, for example, on your central bank, which is the Fed. And normally speaking, to make a long story short, they just park or we see the surge. So they park a lot of money on the Fed, instant giving it out to the public. So what could be a factor? What is driving this? What is behind the scenes? Something that you could tell us maybe about this. So, look, you know, I'm not an economist, but I love the question because it really starts to make me think, you know, the three of us have been trying to analyze, you know, when will the market start reacting to all this stimulus? When will we see a recovery story? Why is there a bifurcation between where markets are and the economies are and whatnot? Where we were on February 12th when we had a robust balance sheet of the banks, where are we now, right? And what a lot of people don't know about the banking system is it's the whole schedule. What, what, what is one of the business models of a bank? It's to lend money overnight, right? right. Keep, banks have deposits on hand, 
right? They're called demand deposits. They keep a certain amount of money on hand overnight in case of a surge, in case of spending, whatever it may be. But And all that excess money, they always want money to be working for them. So whether they lend it to large institutions, whether they lend it internationally or what, obviously that's one of the business models. And the rate that they lend it at is called the discount rate, I believe, right? Isn't that what that is called? Okay, so you are talking about something, and I love that about Salah. Salah's mind is always, look, money never sleeps. Salah's <laughs> mind never sleeps. He's always trying to understand what's going on in the nooks and crannies of the banking system. And obviously, this is something I promise you, most people are not looking into, but surely Salah is. So what could be the reason why banks that have hundreds of millions of dollars and billions and trillions of dollars on hand, what do they do with it overnight? And how do they make sure that their money that they lend out business model wise is secure, right? In a world where we're in a reopening story, there are a lot more unknowns that there are knowns. There are a lot of companies in the recovery story that are not going to be profitable for a long time. Let's be clear about where we are globally, economically, and whatnot. We've got hospitality, airlines, gaming, and whatnot, uh, uh, energy, uh, commodities, right? Companies that are starting to get back online. The supply chains are getting greased. But it will be a long time before an airline that's running at 25 to 50 percent capacity is once again profitable. A, a, sport, a sporting arena, once again, running on 50% capacity. When will it be profitable again? A cruise ship. We've got thousands of companies here on the stock exchange, right? Public companies globally that are not really going to be running at a profitable model for a while as this recovery story starts. So where is it that the these large sums of money that the banks want to always become a profitable business model, where is it that they can be secure in that their lend on an overnight basis is going to be secure? Whether it's the fact that we are printing money like it's going out of style, trillions of trillions of dollars, whether is it that the, that the buyback program of the Federal Reserve is still at a rate of $120 billion a month, right. right? So where will it be that they are going to secure it? Salah has uncovered a number which is kind of fascinating. It could be a little bit over my head. I'm just trying to get my head wrapped around it. But what Salah is saying is that there is fear that lending it to the public sector in bulk, whether you're lending it to banks globally, whether you're lending it to institutions or whatnot to try and make money overnight, that is the discount window where banks will lend hundreds of millions and billions of dollars overnight for a small interest rate uh, sum are now choosing to park their money at the Federal Reserve for virtually a minimal amount of money. Now, let's be clear. If you lend a trillion dollars and park a trillion dollars with the Federal Reserve overnight at a 0.001% interest rate, you are Correct. still making money. The question is, why would they be parking the money at a smaller rate than lending it to the public sector at a larger rate? And that would be the fact is that the security of the economic global situation whether it's to do with the virus of volatility in the vaccine, whether it's to do with the profitable business model of the reopening story, it's, a, it's, it's something to definitely consider. We saw this in 2020, December 2020, when J.P. Morgan came out and said, you know what, I cannot predict the guidance going forward into this right. pandemic, whether when we are all going to be pro profitable again. The bank's balance sheets are more robust than they've been for the last year. We right. are having a recovery story that seems okay. Unemployment, though getting better on a monthly basis, is still holding steady in the millions on a monthly basis. People have walked away from the employment story, right? So there are questions. When will the global economy really be a profitable model once again? And it seems clear that that level of security and wonder and anxiety by the central banks to park money at the Federal Reserve rather than give it to the public sector, is definitely worth wondering what the future is going to bring. To make it clear, Peter, of course, I'm a technical analyst. I love to, to analyze on a technical basis. But like you said and mentioned, it's always really important to look out of the box, looking on really important things that matter at the end. 
macro. and this will come macro of course and this will come definitely also be visible in technical analysis so we are just supporting our readers listeners to look forward and to check the markets and to have this in mind and in focus you know what i will say one thing sorry i'm sure it's time for my to say something but look we have seen now in the market over the last couple of weeks we're going to talk about sell in may and go away we're going to talk about where the markets are right now basically trading at record highs or just a smidgen below that but i think what the market has been doing for the last couple of weeks is kind of trying to figure out the directionality where it what's the next step right is the recovery story going to become one that's right. really robust, really robust and like a slingshot going off into the stratosphere are we going to churn and burn here for a little while trying to figure out what where to put money right uh, uh, from a technical point of view and whatnot and i think for our audience who are looking at technical analysis this look we are no longer in a market that's just doing nothing but go up right we've seen some retracement we saw some quite a severe sell-off in may although it was very short-lived in the tech sector But we are once again going to highlight, guys, that if you're a trader, if you're a long-term investor, markets tell us that they go from the bottom left to the upper right. Long-term investment-wise, sell-offs have been nothing more than a buying opportunity. However, if you are a trader, it is all the more important to use and learn technical analysis because on an intraday basis, guys, the movements in the market where the opportunities lie are all in technical analysis. It's hard to predict the, the, the uh, uh, um, earnings are a rough play right now, guys. We saw earnings season just come to a halt, come to an end. And we did see that stocks that beat earnings on every basis, beat guidance on every basis, did nothing but go down after the announcement, right? For us as technical analysts, and I'm just a moderator, but for us, Salah, it's important to know that price action after earnings declaration is the most and technical analysis are the most important parts of this trading model to be addressed. Correct. Peter, another chapter of the reopening story is inflation. We also talked about it last time, but there is a key barometer and this rose again in April and hit a 13 year high. I mean, there's there's so much money in the markets uh, spent for infrastructure. People got the checks. Uh, sent home but do you feel that prices consumer prices are really go higher when you buy uh, groceries and uh, go shopping you know what i'm seeing it yes there's no question about it and it's you know what look as once again i'm not an economist but i found this inflation story i'm i i i feel i am a i love to try and analyze why the market's doing what it's doing and i also am fascinated by the media who will grab a hold of a Of a, of a word, you know, we saw that last year when the when the yield curve inverted for for you know 23 minutes, and suddenly we were in recession okay. mode. And then a couple of weeks ago, we saw the inflation story become the story of the moment. You know, in French, we call it the the fruit de moment, the fruit of the moment. You know, it's what they're focusing on, and so inflation is the story of the day, right? However, and it it did. They did use that word to describe what happened in the tech sector a couple of weeks ago, right? Now, we did rebound from those lows and that sort of fear that the press was pumping and the media was pumping, you know, that this inflation story was going to really take this incredible rally that we've seen over the last 16 months and put a halt to it. Well, that was not, that was a mistake, right? It was a short-term sell-off. Now, not to say that I know what's going to happen in the near future, but it's clear the inflation story is real. Now, why is it real? Uh, stimulus checks have been sent out. They're coming to a halt. We've been printing money at an ongoing basis. It's incredible. The Federal Reserve is buying $120 billion worth, worth of notes and every instrument in, in the marketplace. We have an infrastructure plan. We've had a stimulus package, one, two, and three of them since, since Trump did one, Biden's done one. We've got another one coming up. So all of that is pumping unlimited and printing unlimited supply of money into the marketplace. What we also did, and I think we touched on it last week, which is sort of me trying to understand what the inflation story is. It's an increase in prices of commodities and services. Okay, now what is this a function of? Let's look at the last 16 months. We had a pandemic. We have a global economy that came to a screeching halt. 
to, as a protective mechanism and as a with a lack of demand for goods and services as everybody stayed home. We did see a surge in the Zooms of the world, Pelotons of the world, the Wayfarers of the world. We did see a surge in companies and the Amazons and the Ebays. There were a group, a sector that definitely did make our lives easier while we were all locked in place. That sector is now seeing a bit of a pause in their rally. But what we did see was so many companies that produce lumber, that produce cars, that produce all different other things come to a complete screeching halt that service the, the hospitality sector, the, the uh, travel sector and whatnot. These companies basically came to a complete and utter halt for about a year, right? And as a protective mechanism against their business model, they have to really lay people off. They have to stop producing and offering these services and, 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 uh, and commodities. We are seeing the story, the, uh, the evolution of this pandemic story and the recovery story as the economies start to open up. Therefore, the demand for goods and services is going up. The, re the, the, the greasing of the wheels of the supply chain of all these services is starting to come on online again. And it just doesn't happen like that. You just suddenly can't suddenly say, I need a million pounds of lumber, uh, a million sleeves of lumber. I need a million of this. I need a million of that. It just doesn't automatically happen. Start producing cars again. You know, this demand chain is a slow one to get online again. So what we're seeing is, and once again, we're seeing what, what the effects have been of the complete global economic shutdown on the employment sector, right? People stayed at home. People were being paid to, to support their lives while they were out of work. And I'm not a proponent of the fact that people are sitting home and they're lazy now. I mean, I do, I do see that people are having a little trouble getting out, of, out from under their tortoise shell and getting back into the world. I get it. That's not my nature. My nature is the minute I was able to get back to work, I came back to work. But the bottom line is there is fear, anxiety around the pandemic. A lot of people in Europe are feeling that. You guys are not as open we, as we are here with the vaccine and whatnot. But the bottom line is it's clear that in order to get people to come back to work right now, to come out of their homes and to really find it a viable source to go back to work, you're going to have to pay people more money. And to produce the goods and commodities that we need to get our economies back on track is going to cost more money. So I do see it happening. You know, I'm seeing it happening in the construction sector in the U.S., it's costing more. I was on a call this morning about something related to my life where I was trying to get something done in a construction sector. And there, the price that I had been, uh, uh, yeah, the quote I had been given back in January is now actually 20% higher to do it now in May and June, right? So the commodities are going up, the price of employment is going up, and the price of services are going up. So yes, there is an inflation story happening. Is that going to put a clamper in the market story? I don't, get, I don't see it happening yet. Is it something that is a forward-looking indicator and that we're going to start seeing it happen in September, affecting the market as it sort of trickles in to the nooks and crannies of the economy? Very possibly. I would imagine if you talk to economists, they're going to say, you know what, Peter, you actually don't know much about this. And once the inflation story unwinds and evolves, September comes along and people really are having to pay a lot more to get people to go back to work for lumber and services, for commodities. Yes, it's going to have an effect on the market. For today, here in May, right now, where the market is, it's not having an effect. Maybe just let me add something. It's it's right now. It's this inflation topic for me is a cluster of factors and variables. I mean, it's the same. Like interests are low still. People can buy houses or are, are interested in building houses, buying houses, much more than before. The weather in soft commodities. Look, the weather this year in Europe, for example, till May, it was one of the coldest seasons. A lot of Of, of our paprika corps in Spain, for example, they didn't have been good. So there are really other factors like in, in housing market, low interest is infecting, of course, or gives a huge positive impact for, for building and buying houses, so for construction. A bad weather and COVID, paprika pickers, you can't 
put two one on a field because there's corona you can just hire one it takes more time it it, it spikes in prices so just let me with, it, make it really short if we have good weather no corona this factors in price will decrease if interest rates will go higher people will not willing be so they are not willing to buy a house like before maybe so these are factors that can change and the you know ring and the Amsterdam uh, cl uh, ring is belling. It's the bell is the ring is belling. <laughs> ringing. You know what? Thank you for saying that because that is actually a great explanation, and I had not really thought of that. The bottom line is that supply chain has been interrupted by COVID, right, and by weather. That's a big factor, and it's affected the commodity and the production of food and services. Right. right? Are absolutely right, and that just doesn't start right whether you're picking grapes for wine whether you're picking paprika for peppers and and whatnot or you're picking vegetables for food and sustenance of the world's food situation you cannot have six people working in the space that used to occupy only one and two during covid you are really got people who have been living at home and not being put back to work and so that supply chain does not just happen when you ring a bell like they just did at the stock exchange <laughs> the, the, the horse race doesn't just start You've really got to get this. This takes a while to grease this engine. So I appreciate that. That is definitely a factor in the supply chain story and in the inflation story. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for, for your information. Um, you brought us the chart of the week. We started with that two weeks ago. And today it's about uh, the currencies, the euro uh, US dollar. Uh, what can we see here on the chart? Yeah, by the way, our last chart of the week all was uh, a really good forward looking trend continuation, which we can see right now. But let's move to euro. Actually, we see a small weakness in the dollar, but we are in really interesting now is the EMA 21, the moving average, exponential moving average in the euro dollar. And you see how technical analysis is working. Our lows that we have created in this new impulse wave since April, they already, uh, they always tested the 21 moving average, what we do right now at uh, one, one uh, dollar spot 21, uh, yeah. And I think if we can hold here, we can see a new impulse wave heading to the 23.6 Fibonacci retracement. And if we can hold it, I think the weakness in the dollar could, we could, uh, could last and we could see more impact on the euro. If uh, traders would participate on that, you could do that with Turbo24. You have knockout levels on the, on the buy and on the, uh, on the uh, short side. If I would consider to be long in this field, I would rather take the technical analysis into, uh, into focus. I would move my uh, knockouts would be interesting for me at least around the 100 moving average, which is on the one spot 20. And on the short side, I would take, of course, the, the high of, uh, of, 20, of, of the beginning of this year, which is almost at yeah, one spot 23.5. So yeah, let's see if we will ha hold and create higher highs, which would be the trend continuation of the euro, or maybe we'll will not validate this trend and then we could participate from from the short side can i i would like to ask a question to sala about the dollar uh, versus the euro and the effect on all of mr biden's proposed stimulus package the incredible printing of dollars here in the u.s we're talking many many trillions of dollars have been fluxed into the marketplace not some in infrastructure and soon to be more infrastructure, but in all the stimulus packages and everything there, printing money, the money has been given all, uh, for unemployment and whatnot over the year, much of that on the price of the dollar relative to the euro. Is that what's putting weight on the dollar? So, sorry, say it again, please. Is that, I is the, <laughs> you've got everyone behind you saying hi. <laughs> I'm just curious what the, what, in Europe, people's perception and they're obviously their trading standards of, uh, of that trade, the dollar versus euro, it, how much of it is being affected by this incredible surge in stimulus and money printing and 
Tre and, tre and the Federal Reserve buying 120 billion in, in instruments going forward. How much of this incredible stimulus package and money being pumped into the system is affecting the price of dollar euro? Uh, it, it still has effect, definitely. But I don't see any huge effect right now on it because if, you, if we look on the dollar index it's still holding the 90 spot area which is really important and i i'm really interested in that because your question is really good why we don't see i would expect a much greater effect on that and this is still not coming so the market is still uh, waiting on on a completely validation of that fact i think you know i i, I it is fascinating we've talked about it the three of us for a year that normal economic uh, um, uh, normal economic effects of the of uh, of the yield curve of inflation of stimulus package would normally in a normal world have such a bigger effect on the dollar euro on the markets themselves on all of these instruments and the S&P 500 yet we've just not seen it happen and it is kind of baffling to think what is really supporting this here, right? Where you know there that we are, we look, we we're just we do have incredible volatility on an intraday basis, but net, 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 that this that who would have thought that we would be sitting here in May, in the still in the midst of a pandemic, and it still actually have no negative effect on the global markets. Correct, crazy, That's incredible. It's just incredible. And maybe crazy is the wrong word. Uh, it's fascinating because markets are, even if history, history can play again and you can see patterns from historical views, it's always curious. It always can have another effect and can be changeable. And this is fascinating on markets and it's never boring. That's why we love it. That's why we are always students of the market, all three of us. Exactly. Forever. Guys, so many topics today. I love it. Uh, I think a lot of uh, important information and a few things we have to just to wait and see where the markets go. So thank you so much, Salah Edide Mumidi, the head of markets at IG today from Amsterdam and the legendary Einstein of Wall Street, Peter Tuckman today from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Guys, thank you so much. Goedemiddag. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs> And thank you for watching. This was the IG Trading Talk. More information on IG.com. See you next time.